to Enlightenment of Change on webtalkradio.net. I'm your host, Connie Whitman. As always, thanks for joining us this week. So every week as you tune in, you know, I I get it, right? Change, we hear that word change, and sometimes it creates panic in us because we don't know what the outcome is going to be. So to help you on your journey of change, please, in the show notes, you'll see I have a free communication style assessment. It will tell you your natural communication superpowers, kind of how people see and perceive you. Flip side, you'll also get a second report, which is your lowest style, which for me, I think is even more impactful because we want to see where our blind spots are and then we can compensate for them, especially as it relates to communicating with family, friends, peers, as well as business clients and or um, uh, colleagues at work. Additionally, to help you, if you'd like more me in your life, which I hope you do, because I'm pretty cool, uh, I have a membership site. Uh, Check it out. Again, that is in the show notes. You'll see all of the cool things that we're doing in the membership. Super affordable. You get me twice a month. Um, So check that out also in the show notes. Now, my motivational quote today is by the amazing Oprah Winfrey. And Oprah says, every time you state what you want or believe, you're the first to hear it. It's a message to both you and others about what you think is possible. Don't put a ceiling on yourself. Now, as I wrote this introduction uh, the other day and I reflected on this quote, I realized the importance of not putting ceilings on ourselves, which we really do a lot. Now, this can be tough as a business owner. We're often in our own worlds and sometimes in our own minds. Collaboration, ongoing learning, trial and error, tenacity, having a healthy mindset, and actually just never giving up are just some of the needed skills that we actually need to tap into ourselves as business owners. Now, having the entrepreneurial mindset can help you start a business, but also help you perform at a higher level in your corporate job as well. Now, if you're thinking about starting a side hustle, launching your own business, you're in for a treat today. My amazing friends and guests, Professor Scott Livingood. I hope I said that right, Scott. Um, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Cool, cool beans. Uh, Scott, also known as Seinfeld Sensei. Uh, Scott earned his PhD in strategic management from the University of Maryland and his master's of business administration and bachelor of science in accounting from Uh, Brigham Young University in Utah. He worked at KPMG and Honeywell International along the way, but his true passion was lying in education. He is the lead author of That's Our Turf, Identity Domains and Competitive Dynamics with Rhonda Rager and has been an award-winning teacher, sensei in Japanese, of strategy and entrepreneurship at at, uh, numerous universities throughout the U.S. and to groups around the world. He's an Ironman, an Ironman, lover of music, movies, and sports, avid traveler, which he is. He's a travel in Woolbury and curious explorer of the world around him. Scott is also fluent in Japanese and sign language. Sen language? Am I saying that right, Scott? Sen sign language? language is in Seinfeld language. That's so, right. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, you're so yes. funny. So with yes. that, we kind of went off, but please welcome Scott to the show. Scott, thanks for being on. And I always love our time together. Yes, thanks, Connie. I'm really happy to, to be here and to, uh, to chat with you a little bit. Yeah, and you know, the entrepreneurial spirit, I think, I'm, I'm just going to tell you my take on it. And then that's really what we're going to talk about today, because that's your zone of genius and what you teach. But the entrepreneurial spirit, yes, it's great to want to open a business and have that spirit. Spirit, But I find some of my corporate clients that as we build those cultures, we talk about that entrepreneurial mindset, that entrepreneurial journey, um, because it's kind of a transferable skill that can serve us in life. I don't know. Where do you where do you where do you see that? Do you do you kind of see that linchpin? Yeah, I 100 percent agree. I think too often we either as academics or practitioners, just people have too narrowly defined the entrepreneurial mindset of starting a new business uh, or starting a new business unit or something like that. But I really think it can extend as we have that mindset to apply that to lots of areas of our lives. You know, at its essence, I think, uh, you know, entrepreneurship is creative value added problem solving, if I were just to put it in in a quick nutshell. And that is something that we need in all aspects of our lives, whether it be personal goals or objectives that we want to achieve, whether it be our family unit, churches, nonprofits, existing organizations, new organizations. I think it can really be extended to lots of different avenues of life. And in that way, 
we raise our own ceilings. And to go back to your Oprah quote, we we can change uh, our destinies and we can change the the lives of people around us for the better. It's a ripple effect, right? And and mm-hmm. that's kind of what we're here to do. And I think the tr- entrepreneurial mindset is really a good start with that. Um, it, the other thing too, when I see this with my corporate clients, more and more the younger generation, especially. Now, I don't know if it's because universities and colleges now offer entrepreneur as, you know, being an entrepreneur and entrepreneurial studies as an actual degree. When I went to college, you know, a thousand years ago, it was you had business administration, business management, or you had marketing. That was kind of your choice or accounting, right? They were your choices. So I think there's more depth. But what I'm seeing with the younger generation, they're getting those full-time jobs to have steady income, but they start these side hustles with the anticipation of kind of stepping into them. I think that is really courageous. Uh, and, and very smart. If I were to advise somebody, and I'm a little bit too, I kind of grew up in the same you know, kind of environment as you did. And my dad was in the military. So he's a career army 25 years. So he was very, uh, I guess, uh, you know, certainty and paths and those kinds of things. He really, he liked, you know, wanted me to work for Honeywell for the rest of my career and build a pension and, you know, those kinds of things. And so I kind of grown up in a very relatively regimented kind of environment yeah. where I wasn't a big risk taker. I didn't really embrace ambiguity or uncertainty, whereas I think that's starting to change a lot where, where uh, you know, younger people are embracing that unknown a little mm-hmm. bit. But how I would tell them to start would be go learn a vocation, get something solid, have a steady paycheck. And while you're doing that, then look for opportunities to, like you said, do a side hustle, follow maybe their passion. It could be out you know, could be somewhere outside of their job. Then once that starts to be successful and you start to either be spending more of your time on that side hustle or it's growing to a, a, a level where the revenue is overshadowing what you're making at your current job, that's the best time then to jump ship and pursue that other um, occupation. So many times people want to do it. And I like a little bit of a safety net, for example, or you know, something to kind of to, to balance that out a little bit. Yeah. Um, but that's, and that's exactly what I do. So my, my teaching is being a professor is kind of my day job. And I love it too, because I can be very creative. I can be very entrepreneurial within that setting there as well. But I'm also able to write a book, for example. I'm also able to consult. I'm also able to help with entrepreneur zones and other passions that I have. I can kind of do that on the side and we'll see. You know, I love doing what I'm doing and I hope to do that for a very long time. But if the other things that I'm doing rise to the level where it's really capturing my heart and my soul and and all of my energy, then I'll at least have something foundational that I can uh, shift to uh, instead of just putting it all on the line for something very uncertain. Yeah. And and, um, I agree. You have to have that safety net or cushion in the bank before you go, you know, full throttle into the business. Um, You know, I had a 13 month package when I left corporate and that's how I was able to open my business. Plus we had money in the bank just in case. So you can't, you know, being opening a business. Yeah. It's risky to some extent, unless you have that zone of genius and you're hardworking, then it works out. Right. But you got to have that safety net because if you're struggling right out of the gate, the business will never get off the ground. It just, it is what it is. What go ahead. Do you want to say something? No, I see, you know, and if people are distracted too, if I'm if I'm worried about where my next meal is coming from, if I'm worried yeah. about my mortgage payment or my rent payment, that can overshadow then the energy that you need to put into and you know the, the thought process that you need to put into thinking about the business, thinking about your customer, those kinds of things. And so knowing that your at least bases are covered, that I think helps free you a lot to be able to pursue your passions and really think creatively and apply your energies towards the customer and the business that you're working on. Yeah. If you're burdened, you're not creative. It, right. it, it, it It's a fact, right? Our brain mm-hmm. just doesn't have the capacity to do all that. What right. it, for you, what are the benefits or especially because this is what you teach, but what are the benefits of the entrepreneurial mindset? What, you know, what do you see with your students and as you teach this? Yeah. So, you know, you talked about first embracing change or very early on, and then kind of that, that ceiling that we set for ourselves one of the things is if there's a self-actualization, I think that comes from entrepreneurial pursuits where I, you know, there's something freeing and satisfying about doing something that you want to do because you want to do it. If I'm working for an employer, you know, to a certain extent, I'm beholden to their direction, to my job description, to yeah. you know, what they're telling me to do. As an entrepreneur, I, it, you know, entrepreneurship essentially is a, is a voluntary activity. 
right? I don't have to be an entrepreneur unless, you know, you're in certain circumstances. And I've actually worked with a lot of, you know, uh, displaced refugees, for example, in developing countries where they don't really have another choice. They don't, they can't get a job anywhere else. They have to kind of do things. But for the most part, we, you know, what we talk about is, is that entrepreneurship is a voluntary activity. And so doing something that you want to do because you want to do it, there's just a great sense of satisfaction and fulfillment that comes from those pursuits. So when I wrote my book, for example, the, the startup of Seinfeld, that was not part of my job. That was, that was just something I really wanted to do. And it was so much fun doing that. It was a ton of work and, you know, a lot of late nights and, you know, try to work through certain things that I was learning as I was going along. But I had the passion and I had the fuel yes. to put up with all of the downsides that came with all the, the, the costs and the sacrifices that came with it because it was something that I really wanted to pursue. And now seeing it out there, actually holding that book and someone will write me and say, hey, I really enjoyed this book. It really helped me learn something, whatever. That's such a satisfying feeling that doesn't often come from our traditional, you know, regular job occupational pursuits. And so to a certain extent, allowing students and allowing people to follow their dreams, follow their passions, take their own unique experiences and perspectives and apply that in a creative value added way. It helps customers, but it also helps those individuals so much to feel that sense of accomplishment and fulfillment in a way that doesn't necessarily come from other pursuits. Yeah. And I say this because I've been in business 21 years, Scott, and I always say owning a business is not for the faint of heart <laughs> because there's always uncertainty. You're always learning. And if you think you can stop learning, like you're done, right? That's right. So, right. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of moving parts and it all is on your shoulders. So this is sure. not for the faint of heart, but it is exciting and challenging and creative and rewarding exponentially. So not that corporate, you know, my corporate career was very um, challenging and rewarding in its own way, but not like owning a business, right? Because it's me, I'm the ultimate decision maker, whether I right. do, do not pursue whatever, whatever that is creating, whatever that class is, or whatever that is that I'm going to teach my clients. Next question, especially because you're in academia, mm -hmm. what's wrong or what do you see is wrong with the current entrepreneurship education that's out there? Remember, we didn't have this when I was in college. Now it is, and this is what you teach. What what are the um, the downsides, or where where do you see glitch, you know that education glitching? Yeah, what, one area, and, and I've been able to see a little bit of the evolution again, this because this is what I do. The evolution of entrepreneurship in academia. You know, mm -hmm. twenty five years ago, probably it was very very new, very just starting to talk about entrepreneurship in the classroom. And what they did is they would hire retired or successful entrepreneurs. Uh, would to come in and essentially they would tell their war stories. They would say, look, this is what I did. This is how I overcame it. This is how you should do it too. And that's very valuable experience. The problem is, Connie, you're a different person than I am. The world is different Absolutely. today than it was when they were there. Yeah. And so their experience and their expertise might not necessarily be as applicable to my, my situation. And so it's hard to kind of learn that way. Well, then if you shift all the other way and say, okay, now it's academics, now it's actually a legitimate field of study. People are getting their PhDs in entrepreneurial studies and those kinds of things. The problem is a lot of those people have no practical experience. So I can tell you about the theory and I can tell you about all these case studies about things that I never experienced myself. And, and although that's important because it's more generalizable, it, it doesn't really tell you how it can actually impact you and how you can you know, I don't have that experience as an academic to kind of work that through. And so I think what happens is, is academia has really kind of swung one way or the other. Either it's all war stories or it's all theory Yeah. and not holding those two together. I think the best course, the best program, the best curriculum has elements of both where there's grounded theory that's been demonstrated uh, by, you know, empirical data and, and, and studies that can be generalizable, but also being able to translate that academic research into real world practical- uh, Application. Le lessons, concepts, those kinds of yeah, applications so that the students can see how it works in general and also that how it can work for them specifically. And so I think the best type of, 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 of entrepreneurial education comes from a blended, grounded in theory, but has a lot of practical application to help students be able to learn and apply themselves when they come into situations that I could probably never anticipate that, you know, that, they, that they're going to face 
as the world changes and as they push the boundaries of creativity and innovation in order to uh, add value to their customers. Yeah, because the past is the past, right? And right. You know, look at Steve Jobs when he created the the uh, I, I think it wasn't iPod. even the, it, the iPod, iPod. yeah, mm -hmm. right. And he said to his team, "I want to be able to have a thousand songs on one little device that people could carry with them." And his whole team said, "Well, the technology doesn't exist." He goes, "I know. We're going to create it." Mm -hmm. But that's that. That to me is the entrepreneurial vision and spirit of we can't go to the past to look. So how do we, we, we know what we have available to us now, how can we push the limits, right? To, to, to expand and create, in that case, the iPod a thousand songs on a little device. So mm -hmm. that's the entrepreneurial spirit. So education is, you know, I have my MBA, you have, you've, you know, advanced degrees, several advanced degrees. Right. Education is so important because it does teach us foundationally, um, the right from wrong is not the right way to say it, but they, they foundationally, what is proven true over and over right. and over again through history, we need to know that. And then that's when we can bring the creativity and innovation to the table and create new. But you have to have that foundation and not think, well, I'm not going to do what they did. Well, it worked. So there is some grounded uh, substance of information that can be duplicatable. And then how do you scale it from them? And it goes back to get the get rid of the glass ceilings, right? The, right? the sky is the limit if you allow the creativity to come. But you have to have some foundational um, info. The other thing I just want, what popped into my head, I see a lot of young people, right, in my with my corporate clients. And they're like, oh, I want to do what you do. And I go, great do work for 10, 15 years right. because you have nothing to teach. You, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't have life yet. Then you could become a coach. Then you can train because you could say you have your own stories to share, not Connie Whitman's stories, right. Of my 40 years in sales. And so all of those, and they go, Oh, like, Oh, they think I'm just going to open a business, but what are you going to, what are you going to do with that business? Right. You yeah, got people have are, people are just going to listen to them. Right, because they open a business. No, but you have to have experience and expertise and, and a message and, and something of value to share yeah. that you gained from your own life experience and business experience. That's not something that somebody fresh out of college is gonna have that foundation to, to work on. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's just it's cute because I I love, I will never squash that kind of entrepreneurial mindset and energy. And I tell them, think about what you would create, keep learning, keep growing, keep building your business chops. Yep. And then think about how can I translate all of this and what is my zone of genius? What is my passion? Whatever it is from there. So yeah, it's, uh, but we need, so it's funny because academia, I, I think the world, we love to, to go into the extremes and mm -hmm. I found the magic in my life. It's always in the middle. You know, That's you right. learn from each side, but real reality is where the pendulum kind of swings in the middle. Um, that's repeatable and that's sustainable, I find, versus ending up on those extremes. So I know that's oh, just my take, right? Yeah, I totally agree. And so and what I try to do, one of my, I guess, values or objectives as an instructor, as a, as a professor, is I, I want to teach people how to learn. And so, and, and I use, you know, again, theories and foundations and, and, yeah. and concepts to do that. But I always want to tell my students, if all you do is memorize, again, what's been done in the past, and that's important to know the foundation. But if all you do is memorize that and then forget it when you walk out of class, I'm not doing you any good. What you need to do is learn how, learn the theories and the foundation well enough that you can apply it to new situations. So the theory might not be new and, and sometimes it evolves and changes and, and those kinds of things and it grows and expands, but being able to apply that and knowing when it's applicable and when it's not, that's really where I think wisdom comes in. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Yeah. Knowledge is just the, the understanding, the basics of how it, it all fits together. But the wisdom is how can I apply it? When is it appropriate? When is it not appropriate? for my particular circumstance. And as then the world changes, I've done a, a valuable service because they're not then applying something to 10 years ago, five years ago, six months ago, they're actually will apply it to something that's new. And so I, I always wanna teach them to learn, not necessarily just teach them a bunch of concepts and theories. It's fascinating when COVID hit and, and you know my story, but you know, 
I had done everything live, right? I've been mm -hmm. in business for so long that I didn't digitize anything because I did everything live. I didn't have to learn the technology and then COVID stopped. My world stopped, Scott. Like right. I had no income. Right. My husband lost his job, two kids in college. Thank God again, here's that safety net. We had money in the bank to live off of. We mm -hmm. depleted it, but we had it. We survived, right. right? We didn't go bankrupt. But the other piece of it was, I remember... And I tease, I say this all the time. I gave myself 24 hours. I'm pretty tough on myself, but I gave myself 24 hours to vomit, be sick, cry, mm. be depressed, all of those emotions, right? Because you got to feel when something bad happens. And this was bad. Everybody was, you know, people were dying. I mean, this was bad. Like to me, this was serious stuff uh, when COVID hit because we, it was, there was too many unknowns. We didn't know, is it going to be three weeks? Is it going to be six years? And right. the second day after that 24 hour, I sat in my office and I thought, you still have your skill. And this mm -hmm. is where I want to just comment on the learning and the application. I had the ability to pause and think, what is my next step? What do I need to learn that I don't know to enter this digital world now? Because what if COVID is here to stay for six years and we have to only work remote? I got to figure this out. I started taking classes, online classes and learning and being in networking and meeting people. And how do you do this? And I 12 hour days, seven days a week, I was doing this because I had such a deficit in a certain amount of, of information, but mm -hmm. I knew, I knew the path forward for the business because of my 19 years at that time of experience. Did that just make sense the way I kind of positioned yeah, it? Yeah, and Connie, and I love you. And you were able to do that. And I think that maybe separated the businesses that succeeded and those that didn't. The only thing I would say is, and, and again, please don't take this the wrong way, but it shouldn't take a global pandemic for us to ask those same questions to everyone. And you, we, we get so busy, we get so yes. caught up in just doing things. We don't take a little time to step back and say, what's gonna, what is the world going to be like in six months? Where are the trends? Where are the areas in my life, in my business, in my personality, whatever it is that can be approved upon? And how can I, you know, oftentimes it takes that uh, what is it? Uh, um, I'm only thinking it's a, it's a Japanese uh, phrase that I'm thinking of, but it's a, a necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. I was th thinking in Japanese, I always forget in English. Um, and so it, it's unfortunate that we had to wait for a global pandemic, for example, for you to see that. But that that reality was probably just as real, knowing that you had to go into a digital. You couldn't be live forever. The, there's, the, the trends were already kind of pushing towards dig digitization. It just all kind of came into our face. And that's one of the things I say about the pandemic. It's like a time warp. What was going to happen five years or 10 years from now just happened within, you know, a week or two time frame where we weren't ready for it. Yes. But it's exactly what you said. Those people and those businesses who are able to recognize what they have, what they need, and how to adapt effectively based on the triggering circumstances are the ones that are going to succeed. But it doesn't necessarily, it shouldn't take a pandemic for us to to realize that that should be an ongoing process. And that's part of the entrepreneurial mindset that I try to teach is yeah. not being complacent, but looking for continuous opportunities to improve and uh, provide value to the customers. You know, it's so true. And I am looking at business differently. I am looking at my business differently never dawned on me that I could sell my business. And when I step, when I choose to step away, probably in another decade or so. Sure. Um, so again, by me going back to that education of um, not business, I wouldn't say it's business education because I, I, I know business pretty well, right? MBA and business, all those things, but the new world, right? What this mm -hmm. new world is going to look like. I'm older. So the digital did not come easy to me. So I had to put a lot more effort where than maybe the younger people. So see, that's the advantage also. And the other thing too, uh, Scott, which I think is important, you have to surround yourself with different skill levels and different age people, because mm. I love being around young people now, because like, I'll say a problem I'm having and they go, oh, you know, the app you should get. And I go, what, what, what's the app? <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm so where before COVID, I was like, yeah, I'll get to it. We got of time. Now I think, what if, what if like the other shoe drops, tell right. me about that app. How can I, will it, will it, it, it complement the other technology that I now have in place that I didn't have in place pre COVID. So we have to embrace the different perspectives from the different ages. And I, I think it's, we have five generations working side by side first time in history that that's happened. 
Mm-hmm. I think that's mm-hmm. exciting because Absolutely. we can learn, like, I know the kids can learn from me, but I, it's like reverse mentor me. Come on, teach me what you got. Because I, I know that the younger people have this just great, they have that entrepreneurial mindset um, much more so than when I was a kid, I think. Yeah. And I see that too. I, one of the great things about being a professor is, you know, I age every year, but my students stay the same age. They're always within that same kind of band. Now, sometimes we get some, we call them non-traditional students, people going back to school and things, but yeah. for the most part, most of my students are kind of in that 20 year old range. And so I, and I see a mistake a lot of my colleagues make is, Hey, look, I have a PhD. I've got all this experience. I'm the one teaching. And that's the only mindset that I have is that I am, you know, I, but to have that learning perspective. And I always try to learn. I try to mix things up. You know, I'm reading articles and I try to, because it's, it's boring for me too. If I'm just doing the same cases, the same articles, the same slides, sure. the same jokes, every semester in and out, it gets a little stale for me as well. So I try to reinvent to a certain extent, you know, I try to keep some things uh, constant, but some things I at least try to add some new life in there. But I really try to learn from my students because they, you just like you said, they have different perspectives and there are things that I can learn. I don't know it all yet. I certainly have, you know, worked hard to know what I do know, but that, that, that constant, I guess, attitude of learning yeah. is really something I think is important for everybody to have, but particularly for entrepreneurs, because the world changes so much, we and we're on the forefront of that innovation and creativity. If we forget or if we stop learning, somebody else is going to come by and 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 overtake what it is we built. And so it's important not only for a survival standpoint, but um, also just for our own personal growth and uh, enjoyment. I'll share a real quick story, and then I have another question before we we uh, sign out for the show. Um, we have a house down the shore, which I know, you know, we were on vacation in July and a little boy debt was early in the morning. I had my coffee. It was quiet. The water was calm. Like there was no noise. It was fabulous. And all of a sudden I hear this splashing. It was a little boy on a kayak from three or four doors down. And his sister comes out, yells, mom, I want you home for breakfast. And the kid's like, SOS, I'm being lost. I'm being pulled out to sea. There was no (laughs) current, right? Right, right. I'm giggling, but I didn't want him to know I was there because he was in his own little magic bubble, right? And then as he was paddling back, he had this whole adventure that he was in a big race in a kayak race. And he had the cheer. You could hear him going, ah, you know, the cheer crowding. I just wrote an article on LinkedIn. And I, and the, the reason I'm telling the story is because after he got, went back to his house, right. And I could hear him talking to his sister down the, the water. Um, I thought to myself, this is my next LinkedIn article. How, why do we abandon fun and joy and creativity? He was 10. He was in a kayak. Like what? I learned from that little boy. He doesn't even know it. He didn't even know I was there, but I learned, I wrote an article on business and how I translated that back to business. We have to be open to others' experiences and observe it from that different perspective of what's my takeaway as a 60-year-old. What did I learn from that 10-year-old? Joy, abandonment, silliness, um, being in the moment, right? Not worrying about anything except having fun. Wow. Wow. That was a big lesson for me, that slowing down to speed up. So we have to be, but we have to see those opportunities, Mm -hmm. right? And that's what we're talking about here. And I think that is the entrepreneurial spirit of where can I learn that next nugget that's going to serve me, my business, my clients, how so I could serve bigger, right? Yeah, I think that's great. I actually use an older Wall Street Journal article that that talks about how, you know, we are kind of born, everyone's born an entrepreneur, at least having an entrepreneurial spirit of asking why. Remember, you think about a little kid, they're always asking why. Why is this? Why is that happening? We're very curious. And then we're thinking, well, why not? And then they try to do things either on our own imagination, with our own creativity, whatever it is. We try to then somehow improve for our own own circumstances, the answers that we get, whatever the why is, we want to maybe do it a little bit differently, a little bit better for us. Yeah. Um, but somehow, like to your point, we lose that. I don't know how it happens over time. It gets beaten out of us, whether it's the academic system that says, there's one right answer That's and right. creativity and going outside the box is not good. Or whether it's us as, as you know, social beings, we kind of, you know, the weird kid or the, the different person always kind of gets kind of either made fun of or, or, or pushed yeah. down or, or, or conformed to, to fit in for the rest. So as we kind of grow up, we lose that natural curiosity. We lose that entrepreneurial mindset of, trying to ask why and trying to make things better and trying to be creative and innovative. And it really is unfortunate that we do that. But every once in a while, if we can just kind of stop and remember that little, because it's inside, we have that little entrepreneur inside of us, just having that, that, uh, those questions and that curiosity and that innovation 
uh, speak to us, I think really can can help a lot of people be a lot happier. Yeah, I, I agree. Agree. And I'm really trying to find those moments as I age. I'm realizing it's funny with COVID hit. I remember going up to my husband every day going, how have I been in business this long and been successful? I don't know anything. Of course right. I knew stuff, right? right. But it's like this whole new world of technology was slapped at me. And I was, but here's the other thing, because I am a lifelong learner, I think, Scott, and that's an important as an entrepreneur. I was, I didn't realize how starved I was for new innovative for me and my business and how I can apply it. It was, I was like a kid in a candy store and I'd go up, you know, and I, most of the stuff my husband probably didn't understand. I'm like, you know what I learned? Oh my God, you know what I'm gonna do? <laughs> and I would go on about how I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that with my business. And I think I could do that. And I think I could serve my clients. And he'd be like, okay, yeah. right? It was like, yes, dear. Right. Yes, dear. Because I was a raving lunatic, learning, excited about what I was learning, but more excited. Information's wonderful. Application is where the magic mm. happens. So mm -hmm. I'm all about the application. Last question. We're out of time, but I want us to yeah. do a little pitch for the E zone. Yes. Let's talk about the E zone and how we believe and the group believes. And you could share how you got involved because um, your curriculum is kind of insightful. But let's talk about that E zone. Can you tell everybody what it is? why you got involved and really what we're trying to accomplish through this, um, the group that we belong to, which is amazing. Yeah, sure. So the E-Zone is short for Entrepreneur Zone. And so basically it's a, it's a community-based um, uh, you know, incentive to stimulate and support entrepreneurial activity. And very quickly, the way I got involved, I, was, uh, I had created a series of courses, uh, online courses uh, for continuing professional education and uh, Uber was one of our, our big clients there, and they, they uh, gave that to a lot of their drivers. Another group at ASU found out about that and said, listen, we're working with displaced refugees in developing countries. Can you adapt your curriculum to that audience? So I got to go to Uganda and actually talk oh. to various people within the ecosystem, entrepreneurs themselves, and you know, uh, venture capitalists, and academics, and incubators, and all those things, to really rework the curriculum to make it more applicable to people who are just starting out, make it much more process-oriented. And then, and then the process, I wrote my book, The Startup of Seinfeld, and that's how I met Hunter Hastings. He, he had me on his podcast, and we talked, and I was very evangelical about how I really see entrepreneurship as the way for people to help change their lives and generations to come. And he said, you know what, you don't have to go to the other side of the world to find people who can benefit from that entrepreneurial mindset. I know this guy out in Jersey, and that's Dr. Dale G. Caldwell who has a very similar uh, you know, philosophy. So the three of us met for about a, you know, six months or so, talking through what are these E-zones? How can we help people of color, people uh, in low socioeconomic status, the people who could really benefit from the entrepreneurial mindset? How can we help create something that really helps them? And so that's where the E-zone kind of concept was uh, formalized and, and, and grew. And that's what we're trying to do is we're looking for opportunities. We're looking for areas that could benefit from, again, community-based, supportive uh, programs in which my curriculum and training um, and funding and those kinds of things it plays a part. How can we help people be more entrepreneurial to make sure that they break the cycle of poverty so that they can change their lives, the community's lives, their customers' lives, and their children's and children's children's lives? Uh, and we see entrepreneurship as a vehicle that does that. Yeah. And, and, and I was introduced to Dale uh, by a colleague and loved him, loved. And then he invited me to be part of the E-Zone, which of course I'm all about giving back. And we have to teach people how to take care of themselves and we have to eliminate poverty and we have to change you know, the future generations as a mom. Like to me, this was a no brainer to step in and help my zone of genius is sales. Right. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I always give my two cents cause I'm not, I'm verbal. <laughs> Absolutely. Meetings. And it's great. And we, and that's exactly what it was. There's the three of us, you know, as Dale Hunter and I from the beginning, we just kept meeting people and inviting people as part of the family with which you part uh, become a very valuable a contributor because you have a different perspective. And that's, again, hopefully we're, we're walking the walk or talk um, and listening to other people and, and trying to bring in other people's perspectives and expertise of how we can make these E-zones really successful for people all across the country and then eventually all across the world as well. So, but you're right, just people knowing that there's a different option than whatever it is that their parents had or their grandparents or, or the people around them have, entrepreneurship provides that path and again, I'm very evangelical about the the destiny and the um, you know life changing value and and power of the entrepreneurial mindset. And yeah, I think I have some some curriculum that helps. I think I get experience to help people along that way. 
um, to the extent that it, it, it's beneficial, then I'm happy to share that and happy to have people utilize that. And we all have, and that's the beauty of entrepreneurship is we all have our own unique value added ways to contribute uh, to the world around us. And that's uh, all what we're trying to do with our e-zones. Yeah. And I love it. And the people we meet, you know, these, these business owners from Africa and from these uh, very impoverished areas now relocating to the U S taking that entrepreneurial spirit here and mm-hmm. creating magic in their businesses. And they're very active in the E zone, which I love learning from them. They're so spirited and so smart and so courageous. It's really a pleasure um, to be part of this and contribute and help and hopefully create this whole new wave of entrepreneurs going forward. It's truly an honor to be part of the E-Zone. Well, you just described the history of America over the last 250 years, right? It was people coming from different walks of life, from different countries, from different areas, applying that innovation and that entrepreneurial mindset to make America what it is today and hopefully getting better. Uh, But that's exactly what we're trying to tap into is that creativity from everybody. Uh, to really make the world a better place. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. So yeah. Thank you for sharing about the E-Zone and um, we should probably put a, a link. Do we, if we have a link, I'll put it in the show notes, everyone, if anyone's interested um, where you feel you have a zone of genius that might be worthwhile, or you are in a lower income area where you think that the entrepreneurial zone can help the E-Zone can help you maybe solidify what you're thinking in your head. Um, it's it's just a great resource. How many are set up now? We have 15 E-Zones set up? It, it, it changes every week. Dale is out there hustling. So we know we've expanded to Chicago and Boston and New York and New Jersey. And I'm in Colorado now trying to, to do things here. Hunters in California trying to do things. So it grows, uh, you know, on a, on a regular basis. And uh, that's a great problem to have, right? It is a great situation to have is yes. I can't pin it down exactly how much, but again, we're, we're not teaching, we're not telling anybody something that they don't know, right? It's very logical. It's very um, acceptable understanding that, hey, this is something that we really, we can do. And it's, again, it's very community oriented, very uh, you know supportive, where we can actually help each other be better. It's not necessarily competitive. So many, so oftentimes we get in that um, you know, that kind of uh, 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 mindset where it's, you know, a fixed pie or it's you against me, but this is really something that we hope can make ever, all the ships rise as we rise the tides. And yeah. so, yeah, we're, we're uh, expanding very quickly and um, it's exciting to, to be part of it. It is, it is. It's, it's wonderful. So again, more to come on the E-Zones guys too. Um, great way to give back. And um, yeah, we got to help each other, man. We got to help each other. We're in this together. So, That's right. That's you know, right. we want tomorrow to be better than today for our kids, certainly. And, and for me, for my kids, my grandkids to come, none yet, grandkids, great grandkids, et cetera. So here's the deal. I know you all need more Scott in your life because I do. So website, please uh, check out his website. Of course, it's SeinfeldSensei.com. And if you want to email him directly, it's SeinfeldSensei at gmail.com. Uh, pick his brain, ask him questions. Um, he's he's a joy and a delight to hang out with and work with and um, brilliant at all, all in one, one package, uh, Scott. <laughs> Well, thanks, honey. You read that just like I wrote it. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> you can pay me later, kiddo. Yes, awesome. uh, thank you so much, Scott, for being on. Uh, always a pleasure. My pleasure. Yes. Thanks, Connie. We'll see you soon. Yes. And I hope you will join me weekly as we question, build and discover together, no matter where you want on your journey of change or your journey on the entrepreneurial or the entrepreneurial journey. I hope my guests and I provide tips, tools, strategies, ideas that maybe you didn't think about. I said it before, I'll say it again. Information is a beautiful thing. Information without application, it's just information. When we start to apply, put it into action, man, oh man, magic starts to happen. You have the power to change your life. I hope that Scott and my conversation today got some of your wheels turning on your journey of change, whatever that means to you. Um, Thanks for tuning in to Enlightenment of Change with me, your host, Connie Whitman on webtalkradio.net. I'm truly honored to have you on this journey. And I really do hope that my guests and I are making a difference in your life. Be inspired, apply some ideas that you learned today and watch the magic that happens in your life. I'll see you all next week. Have a great one. Thanks. 